Hello everyone. Shabai ke amontron US Embassy Dhaka ebang Desh TV bishe shayjon a conversation with Bangladesh, Bangladesh e shathar da unushthane. We are looking back and looking ahead of the US-Bangladesh relationship. To discuss this issue, we have a young Bangladeshi development practitioner here with us. It is my great pleasure to welcome Mr. Asif Saleh, Senior Director, BRAC. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome to a conversation with Bangladesh. Thank you, pleasure to be here. And we have our distinguished panelists. Let me introduce Mr. Alif Rahman, Executive Director of Northern Group, Mr. Anuher Khan, Managing Director of Desh Energy, Sabhanaz Rashid Dia, founder of One Degree Initiative, Mr. Korvi Rakshand, founder of Jago Foundation, Avi Kalum, founder of Bridge We, Mr. Zunaid Mamun, Bangladesh Youth Empowerment Society, working as a research associate. Thank you very much. And we are really happy and excited to have back U.S. Ambassador to Bangladesh, Ambassador Dan Mozina. Sir, welcome to our show. Thank you very much, Sabir. I'm very happy to be here. And hello, Asif. Hi, hello. And hello to our panelists. Uh, and sir, thank you very much for hosting uh, the show in your home once again. Thanks. Uh, you have a beautiful home. Thank you. I love, <laughs> I love my home. Thank you very much. So, so sir, uh, what a year it has been. Uh, uh, can you please uh, talk about uh, uh, American Embassy's uh, accomplishment uh, since you arrived here in since, uh, November 2011? Oh, November 19, 2011. I remember it well. First, I, I have to say that coming back to Bangladesh, for my wife, Grace, and for me, ha has been a dream come true. And you know, sometimes dreams are bigger than the reality. And when a dream does come true, oh, you come a little bit disappointed. That is not us. This dream has come true for us. And the reality is bigger than the dream was. We are so happy, uh, Sabir. We are so happy to be here, to be back in Bangladesh. And as I look back over this past year, well, like you said, it has been a year. For me, the highlight is this. In May, uh, Secretary Clinton came. Uh, you might, or you probably don't remember, but you might remember that when I came here, the very first day, or it might have been the second day, I said my dream was to have Secretary of State Hillary Clinton come to Bangladesh, and while she's here, to sign some kind of agreement to establish uh, a partnership, uh, a formalized partnership, between America and Bangladesh. Well, in May 5, 6, she came. It was fabulous. And she and the Honorable Foreign Minister Deepu Moni signed uh, an agreement in front of uh, the Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, to establish a partnership dialogue between America and Bangladesh. It was one of the greatest days of the year that was. And in September, we held the first session of that partnership dialogue, and that was in, uh, in Washington. And then Foreign Secretary Kaish went to Washington and had a, a day and a half uh, meeting, a partnership dialogue, and we established the strategic direction for our uh, relationship. It was everything that I had dreamt of. So that was a big highlight. Those are two big highlights. The Edward M. Kennedy Center for Public Service and the, and the Arts. Uh, down in Damondi. That was a highlight. Oh my, you've seen this. This is a beautiful facility right in the middle of the University District of Dhaka. America has come back. We used to be there just a little bit away. Oh, for reasons I don't know, we left a long time ago. Now we're back. And that's where we should be. This is a great space. And it's filled with people, young people, all the time. And that, that too, is, is a dream that, that where the reality is greater even than the vision was. So tho those are some of, some of the highlights. Our, our partnership. The, the foreign minister recently said that the relationship between America and Bangladesh has never been better. She's 100% right. 100% right. No exaggeration. I agree fully. In the 42 years now of, of our relationship, it has never been better. And, and this partnership has such a record of achievement, of, uh, uh, of helping Bangladesh uh, lower uh, maternal mortality rates. Man Bangladesh is going to achieve its Millennium Development Goal. Think of that. Not many countries are. Uh, 
uh, helping Bangladesh lower uh, child under five mortality rate. Again, Bangladesh is on the track to achieve that Millennium Development Goal. Not many other countries are. Uh, Bangladeshi families can have the family size they want. The fertility rate of Bangladesh has come down to replacement level. Oh, how many countries in the world wish they could say that? And then uh, we've had cooperation in countering violent extremism, countering terrorism, uh, cooperation in promoting food security. Do you know that Bangladesh now has rice surplus? Wow. I remember somebody very, very famous, I won't mention the name, said this, that Bangladesh is a bottomless basket. What a funny basket <laughs> that is. <laughs> Here is a basket, not only that has a bottom, it's overflowing. <laughs> and my prediction is this, and you can send me an email, Sabir. <laughs> I say within a decade, Bangladesh, listen to this, that Bangladesh will be food self-sufficient. Here you are in the most densely populated country in the world, for, uh, except for some city states mm -hmm. and a little island country. Food self-sufficient. I hope Bangladeshis are really proud of that. Uh, I think that will be reality uh, within, within a decade. Sir, thank you very much. That was really inspiring, especially as a Bangladeshi. And uh, Asif Bhai, Mr. Ambassador mentioned about uh, like uh, Bangladesh is close to achieve some of the million development goals like child mortality and uh, like Maternal birth rate. Health. So yeah. um, your organization, BRAC, works extensively with Bangladeshis all across the country. Absolutely. So what are the significant development you have seen uh, recently? Yeah, I think I share um, the ambassador's excitement. I think absolutely as a Bangladeshi, we're very, very proud that Bangladesh has been growing sig uh, significantly, 6% on average, but I think as the recent Economist article pointed out, that our growth has been a lot more inclusive than most countries within the South Asia. And the testament to that is how, you know, even 20 years ago, there's so many, you know, about roughly 500 new mothers uh, would die. And now the rate has come down to about 192, just within 20 years. There are now more girls going to school. There used to be a huge gap. Um, and then more girls than boys who are going to school right now. And, uh, and, and Every sphere, I think, like the Honorable Ambassador has pointed out, that you, know, you feel that the country is emerging. There's an excitement. And the huge driver of this excitement is the younger generation. I mean, I think it's that, um, I mean, you know, we call it the population dividend, uh, where the, the, the majority of the population is working population right now. And, and they're so entrepreneurial. There's so much energy, so much vibrancy that you, know, you can feel it, uh, whether it's culturally, whether it's in sports, whether it's in new kind of opportunity creation. They have arrived, they're coming up, and they're looking for ways to break through. And uh, so in spite of all the things we see in the headlines uh, every day, I mean, there's another story to tell. I mean, it's almost, I feel like there are parallel stories that are happening. One is a decaying old style um, Bangladesh, and there's one is the new emerging Bangladesh that is kind of in spite of all the resistance that's moving on, marching ahead. So I think that's very, very uh, positive. And, and everybody's playing a role in that, whether it's the uh, social sector, whether it's the private sector, and, and people who are I mean, outside any sector, the indi working independently. Fantastic story. So and I think it's a very exciting time. Absolutely. And you mentioned that youth being the driving force. Uh, let's hear from the driving force here with us. Uh, what significant development you have seen in Bangladesh? I think from our end, what really made 2012 very special from, at least as a young pe person that I can say, is that the amount of activism, activism that we've seen in 2012. Um, there has been many um, incidents and obstacles, you know, with the Ramu incident, then with the Bishwajit killing, the political violence incident. But the fact that people were united against it, and through different social media, they went forward, they had protests, you know, they were out on the streets. I think that has been a lot more than the other years. And I think the fact that we were so united, the fact that we were so pushing forward towards the right agenda, I think that's incredible that we're coming together as a, as a community, as a country, and I think that's incredible for Bangladesh. I think uh, the participation of youth in, in different sectors have increased a lot in, in last year, and actually last couple of years, like uh, three, four years. Uh, before we didn't see this amount of participation from youth, uh, and if and if you look at the future, uh, 
the awareness has already been done of volunteerism. Uh, now I think there's some scopes that they need. I, I think uh, the government, uh, the private sector, and the NGO sector have to create some scope for these people, invest something, and when, when I say invest, it's not only financial, but there has to be mentorship program and scholarship for all these young people, and also scopes for them to practice what they believe. A lot of people, everybody I will say, talk about young people, and they say, oh, they're the leaders of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's true. I'm not saying that's not true. But they're the leaders of today. I mean, just look at the people here. They are not the leaders of tomorrow. They're <laughs> leading right now. Absolutely. And each one can take 10 minutes and tell you what he or she's doing. And it's amazing. And they're not unique because I travel around this country all the time. I, I told President Zila Rahman when I gave him my credentials, I'm going to visit all 64 districts. When I said that, I didn't know how big this country was. I didn't know how hard that would be. But, but I'm going to do it. It's the last thing I do. And everywhere I go, everywhere I go, everywhere I go, I meet young people just like them. There's nothing unique. Uh, with due respect, they're not unique. There are many people out there who are leading today to build Bangladesh. Just to add to that, one thing I would say, though, uh, it's almost uh, the youth um, lacks a voice right now. I mean, you almost want to kind of uh, highlight or have a group who, who wants to talk about issues that are relevant to them. Although they're leading, but they're also needing, they need a lot of uh, sort of assistance. I mean, like you're saying, in di all these different areas, they're, what are they they're lacking? They lack certain opportunities. I mean, if you basically build, uh, they lack, sometimes they lack skills. I mean, how can we kind of, oh, and a lot of times they would, but nobody's there to kind of amplify their voice. I think that's, some, that's a missing link that I, I, I see. I don't know if you guys would agree with that. Yeah, yeah uh, I would like to make a point on that because over the past few years, I have seen a lot of young people start stepping up and starting their own organizations st in the private sector and the nonprofit sector. And they're very enthusiastic and passionate at the same time. Some of them lack some of the skills which can, uh, which can boost their organizations and work a lot. Because people are more courageous now, young people are more ambitious and more passionate. So if that is fueled by and supported by some f supporting facilities, then that can be great. I think Afik is uh, talking about the role of mentorship. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is uh, missing in Bangladesh? I am really happy that just yesterday, uh, I got to participate with the Minister of State for Youth and Sports in the launch of a new program, which I, 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 think, I, I think I'm right on this too. I think this is going to become my number one most favorite program of everything America does in partnership with America. This is going to be the best. Because this program, the Leadership Development Program, LDP, Leadership Development Program, work, will work with 24 thousand young people and community leaders at the local level to do just what Alvik said, to help these people who, who are want to do something. Mm -hmm. They have passion. They want to make a better country. And to help them have the skills and tools so they can realize those visions. And that's what this program does at the local level, which as any, every American agrees, Governance is most important at the local level because that's where it's closest to the people. And that's where this program is focused. And one element, coming back to Sabir's question, in, in that uh, new program, the Leadership Development Program, is mentoring and, and sharing experiences. Because I think that's very important. There's no reason why young people today have to repeat all the mistakes that my generation made. Why? Don't do that, because you're going forward. Adda report jai nitshi chhota ka biroti amade shathi tha kun pichhe kichu khona mothe.
দেখছেন আ কনভারসেশন উইথ বাংলাদেশ বাংলাদেশের সাথে আড্ডা অনুষ্ঠান we are uh, talking about uh, many opportunities and uh, growth bangladesh uh, has shown but i'm sure new challenges have emerged as well young people are coming up but i feel the uh, their participation and the mentorship are being uh, too much centralized to the divisional areas like in dhaka itself dhaka or chidogang or rashtri but in the rural areas there are many youths who can be the leaders of tomorrow who can lead the nation like when you are not mentoring or you are not giving the platform to the rural youth like if i talk about the bishojit killing the killers they are from rural areas and when they get the platform they are being perverted by another effect and that is of course negatively so i think we have to reach the rural youth also so that can uh, bring a good result a positive result too uh, you made a very good point and uh, we have uh, panelists from business community uh, like many times it is said that uh, the political uh, uh, instability directly affects the local business and also uh, doesn't attract foreign investment uh, please no, share i completely your agree uh, political instability does have a significant impact on industrial development and quite invariably when we uh, go for new projects and the most important discussion that does take place with our financiers or bankers is the political instability or the uncertainty that looms with because largely even in the private sector our businesses are dependent with the government with regards to gas connections or other infrastructure requirements when a government approves certain permissions within the regime and towards the end right now we're coming up to the elections it becomes even more significant whether the next government is going to respect these contracts and we want to see these extension of these contracts being honored or being upheld by the next government coming in this respect within the industry should prevail and thus political uncertainty does cause issues with industrial development and such as even things like interest rates also cause problems because because of these sort of issues i think bangladesh the potentials it gets under i mean better way to put it would be it gets undermined because i completely agree with the ambassador and his enthusiasm that bangladesh has great potentials to expand and i think if we can work on certain issues i think we can really reach there and really reach our agendas and our goals more effectively I I agree with him in in the sense that uh um political climate is definitely an issue especially when you're looking at uh, joint venture investments um because whenever you have a foreign party coming into Bangladesh they look at all the headlines and the newspaper articles and they see that uh, you know that there is uh, there is a strike or something like that and they get really worried from my personal experience I can say that uh, we have a joint venture factory and the partners get really worried whenever there is a strike or something like that it is difficult for even the staff working in those factories to go to the factory on that particular day that's something um we need to address and the other thing is um the cost of capital is definitely uh, for a developing economy interest rate at being at 18% um you have to be really doing something magical to in order to pay off your debts uh th- then 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 you know thinking about profit after an 18% interest rate is 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 a challenge is a very big challenge i have spoken uh several times on my vision and this is my fervent belief of bangladesh really as the next asian tiger you've heard me say maybe you haven't that i think this country will be the royal bengal tiger that's my image the royal bengal tiger i love that image and for that to happen uh, uh bangladesh will be should be could be the, the world's largest exporter of ready made garments and household textiles and a major major global player in in small freighters and generic pharmaceuticals and uh footwear and leather goods and jute and silk and bone china and tile and the list goes on and on but th- there are challenges to that vision becoming reality and and some of the challenges are very well known and and they would include the port uh power energy uh shortages roads railroad corruption's a challenge a uh, rule of law is a challenge and and then to pick up on your thread uh the threat of political instability i just had a big huge american buyer in my office on thursday he has 300 million dollars of business and he's looking for a place to take it 
And he's had, uh, you know, of course, I say, come to Bangladesh. This is where you should be. And, and he wants to be here, but at the end of the day, he might not be here. Uh, because, because what he said to me is the risk of uncertainty. And, well, you're businessmen. You understand, uncertainty is killing. And he, and what, I'm, I'm quoting this guy. He said, I would rather pay more for my shirts, he buys shirts, and be able to sleep at night because the uncertainty is managed. And he cited Cambodia and Vietnam. That's, he's looking at those places. And he said, uh, both of those places have what's called a better work program with the International Labor Organization. And so issues like workplace safety, issues like uh, uh, ability to associate workers to associate and, and create unions, uh, those things have all been dealt with. And he said he can sleep like a baby. He has business in both of those countries. But here he's unsettled. But this is his his source of choice, he made very clear to me, uh, if he could make the risk so he could sleep better, uh, he'd want to come here. Uh, Asupai, I think, uh, yeah, I would, I would add to that, that you know, in a sense that um, there are a lot of business opportunities if we basically, of course, have a very stable environment. But at the same time, we need to, for the people who are in the business sector, we need to also be very responsible on how we grow the business. I mean, we shouldn't, uh, I mean, I know there are a lot of challenges, but at the same time, uh, the issues of wage, the workplace safety, those have to be ensured. And I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of responsible business owners, but there are maybe a few uh, who gives the entire industry a bad name. But as a business community, they need to be more and more responsible, particularly now we are living in a much smaller world. I mean, what, what happened in uh, Tazreen garments, actually had a vibration in the rest of the world. I mean, we were on ABC News in the US. I mean, I got calls, uh, I mean, Walmart people were calling left yeah, and right. Yeah, it was widely covered by the It was the very widely covered media. by the international media. It still media. is. It still yes. is, and it, the repercussion is ongoing. So I think, I would say, so growth is great, but it has to be managed responsibly, and it has to be very inclusive. But at the same, I, I, it, that's gonna be the challenge, I think, in the next years, because when the country grows fast, then also there's a lot of inequity that creates. The rich gets richer, poor gets poorer, uh, if it's not inclusive. As a result, a lot of social unrest happens. So all these young people with a lot of energy, if they don't get the right opportunity, that gets translated into wrong things, right? Absolutely, and uh, Zunaid, one of our yeah. panelists, mentioned that. Uh, sir, uh, uh, he mentioned about uh, working with rural people and uh, working with uh, people outside of the major districts. And you have traveled extensively throughout the Bangladesh. And uh, you have actually, I guess if I'm not wrong, traveled almost half of the district just out of half. The, just, just the half. And I haven't myself traveled in, in that many <laughs> districts. So. How, how has it been? And you know, Sabir, people sometimes say to me, "Why are you traveling all the time? Don't you have anything to do?" <laughs> and uh, and the answer is, "This is what I'm doing." And because how to understand Bangladesh unless you see it and talk to people? Because when you go out, as I do, and you talk to especially young people, you see what Zunaid's talking about. You see all that passion, I will use that word, that wants to accomplish something. And, and coming back to what I was talking about a moment ago, the leadership development program. This is not for DACA. This is uh, for 150 union parishads in 16 different districts, 24,000 young people and community leaders. So I'm hearing you. And we're taking a program right to the grassroots. And because that's where we should be. And that's where the people are. That's where the leaders are. And that's where the agents of change are. Doshok Kotha Bolsi, U.S. Ambassador to Bangladesh, Ambassador Dan Mozina, Ebong Brake Senior Director Asif Saleh Shate. Amade Shate Thakun.
Welcome back to a conversation with Bangladesh, Bangladesh Shatharda Onushthane. You all have mentioned about the role of youth uh, and how important it is to have uh, the spirit of volunteerism. Uh, I know like uh, we have uh, our, like, our panelists here who works with youth extensively. Uh, Corby, maybe you can add, uh, you, you are planning to set up your organization throughout Bangladesh. So how has your experience been? As I told before that the youth, they're already <coughs> interested. The concept of volunteerism has spread after a long, long time. Last time we, we saw people volunteering for the independence of this country. But for the last three, four years, we have been seeing that young people are getting involved. One of the sectors that I want to focus is to, uh, for the young people to join the politics. They have to be the role. They have to take the roles there. But now we have seen our uh, Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, and the opposition leader. Both of them have requested the young people to come on board. But they never showed the way how. How I, I, is the example of Bishwajit? Uh, that is how we should do politics? That is how young people should get uh, involved? No, there are different ways. If you can categorize those uh, ways for the young people to join. Thank you, Karbi. And my, uh, my question, uh, this question uh, to both of you is like, what is the next step for the youth? Volunteerism, leadership programs. But how do they actually uh, actively uh, uh, contribute to the society? Well, an American's response to that question will always be the same. Uh, you start at the local level. A and you, uh, you, work, you work with your, your community. That's the, uh, that's the smallest entity, your neighborhood, your community. And, and maybe you organize your friends or your classmates at school or whatever. And then you go from there. Uh, you work at the union part, then you maybe move up to the union part shed level, upazila level, and, and then you, you come up that way. That, that's the American way. You know, we don't start at the top, we sort of start at the bottom and, and work our way up, uh, up through the system in terms of, 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 of uh, gaining access to the political process. Of course, in Bangladesh, which is the leader in the world in terms of civil society, there is actually a parallel route uh, of working with civil society. Uh, many of the panelists, uh, uh, I think four of them, have started their own various NGOs. Well, that's one thing you can do. At a local level, you start an NGO. Or Change will, of, of course, have to come from within. I mean, we have to solve our own problem at the end of the day. And there are lots of activities happening uh, here and there. So I think the important thing would be to connect as well. Uh, I would agree that it has to be come from community to community. Uh, but at the same time, also there are roles for the government, the social sector, NGOs as well, to look at the entire ecosystem. We were talking about the Tazreen uh, garment fire incident. Um, my question uh, to Alif Bhai is, uh, do you think that this incident would actually lay the foundation for uh, the uh, workers' safety and compliance issues uh, in the factories? Um, I believe that this would be a stepping stone and it will lay the foundations for better safety standards in, in, in garment factories because um, it's being such a tragic incident for, for the industry as a whole as well as all the other stakeholders in that industry. But we have to keep in mind that it is not only the, um, it is not only the responsibility of the entrepreneur to, work, you know, to have proper safety standards in their factory, but it, it is also the responsibility of the other different stakeholders. Um, let's, let's talk about um, the licensing authorities here, the government, the infrastructure facility that they have, um, say, let's f say, for example, the fire department, right? The fire department, the equipment for the fire department is actually provided by the government, not by the private sector. So if ensuring that if in case there is a fire, they have proper equipment to actually fight the fire, that's something I'm looking at. The other issue that I would like to add is um, when, whenever we are talking about uh, the foreign buyers, they also have a responsibility in ethical sourcing. They'll have to pay more to factories who meet those standards rather than going to the cheapest factory. I, I see it a, a little bit differently than that. You have so many buyers, they have different factories. Factories are constantly changing. It gets very amorphous very fast. Uh, I agree with your starting point that uh, th the tragedy that is Tazreen fire, I think 
like the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York City in 1911, completely changed America forever, maybe Tazreen will have the same impact here. I'm very encouraged by what I see. Uh, just yesterday, there was a tripartite agreement of labor government uh, and owners to, in fact, uh, put in place a plan of action in February. Meanwhile, coming to your, your points, I see a huge role for BGMEA, the Garment Manufacturers Export Association. And, and I call on them to uh, create a standard for workplace conditions, a standard for fire safety for all 4,500 factories, no exception. It would be a standard consisting of sprinkler system, dedicated water supply, fire extinguishers, exits that are open and adequate indoor and outdoor, public address system. None of this is rocket science. Everybody knows this. A, a clear, simple, concrete standard, and BGMEA must impose that standard on all factories, no exception. Any factory says, oh, I don't think I'll do that. OK. BGMEA controls the import licenses. Guess who doesn't get an import license? Guess who goes out of business? Look, you have a, you have a garment factory. You know everything I'm saying. Yes. That way, all factories are competing on a level playing field, except it's not at the bottom. It's here, safe. And, and proper working conditions and safe conditions. That's my vision, and that's, that's what I'm saying to BGMEA, that there is the role they can play. And answer with uh, labor safety and uh, labor rights. Uh, uh, there's a, a severe <coughs> social implication attached to it as well. Corby, uh, maybe you can add. The rate of tax that uh, Bangladesh is right now uh, giving on e exporting dresses to uh, America is the second highest. And where we were requesting that can we do it a uh, duty-free market for Bangladesh, there are millions of uh, people attached to this uh, RMG sector in Bangladesh. There are so many ladies who have joined. Uh, they're, they're getting job because of this market. And if you just multiply that they're running the families, is there any way or any statement that you would like to uh, say on? Well, it's not a tax. Uh, it's a tariff. Uh, and let me clarify what it is, because it, uh, it is constantly misrepresented. Uh, Bangladeshis do not pay that tariff. I pay that tariff. When I buy a Bangladeshi shirt, the price of that shirt will also include the fact that there was an average 15% tariff on, on that product. I would have as a highest priority engaging with the government of the United States to eliminate that tariff because uh, buyers and owners tell me if that tariff were removed that the ready-made garment and the knitwear industries of Bangladesh would grow explosively. I'm just repeating what people tell me. These are smart people. Here, here's just a smart uh, manufacturer. So that's what they tell me. I would think largely by removing tariffs, it would make our products cheaper. Would would be in the interest of the U.S. consumers, I would think. Oh, you're making part of the argumentation. But right now, when, when you go to Capitol Hill, and I go to Capitol Hill all the time, uh, and, and I meet with people. This is part of my job, to try to understand what are they thinking on Capitol Hill. They're not thinking what you just said. What you just said is a very rational statement and a powerful argument for why you would want to remove those tariffs. But that's not what they're thinking. You sit down with these people. The, I'm talking about members, and, but mainly staff. And you say, you talk about Bangladesh. What do they talk about? Do they talk about removing tariffs? Never. Not to me. They talk about the labor situation. They talk about the, uh, the fact that a labor organizer was murdered and his murderers have yet to be found. They talk about the fact that other people trying to organize labor are, are, have uh, 
charges pending against them for two years. They, they talk about workplace safety. That's what they talk about. They talk about Rohingya uh, who uh, are, are having harder access to basic humanitarian assistance. And they, they share their concern about the, the uh, future integrity of Grameen Bank. That's what they talk about. I'm just telling you. Uh, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying you can go up there. Go to Capitol Hill, knock on the door, sit down, and say, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I'm from Bangladesh, and they're going to say, bum, bum, bum. Okay, those issues can all be handled and, 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 and pushed through. Biroti Aro Akbar, a conversation with Bangladesh, Bangladesh is a third thakun. Shagut Arakbar, a conversation with Bangladesh Shonushane. Adda Dichi, US Ambassador, Ambassador Dan Mozina, Ebong Bracket Senior Director Asif Saleh Shate. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Asif Saleh. Asif Bhai, uh, Bangladesh is entering uh, in this uh, very important year for us, the election year 2013, and there's this big argument about how the, con the uh, conduct uh, of the election, how the election should be conducted. So, uh, what are your thoughts? Nobody likes uncertainty, right? So, I think the challenges of course to uh, have a sort of a, a effective uh, peaceful election which is where people's wills are uh, represented so but I think the important thing is also as we enter the election year and the election uh, atmosphere starts to kick in that how that we actually talk about the issues as well the real issues I mean you know you know the issues like uh, the issues that pe impacts people and uh, I, oftentimes we get too much into this nitty gritty technicalities of these things and as a result the election comes and goes and nobody whether the election uh, part, the parties the rep, uh, sort of kind of uh, delivered on the promises they made on the previous elections what are the issues in questions what are the emerging issues that are uh, uh, kind of happening I mean 1.7 million young people are entering the job market now Who's basically talking about them? Who's talking about creating opportunities for them? So those are the things that needs to be talked about. We need to get into that, that kind of mindset. Coming back to our earlier conversation and also, also to Asif's comment, I think that in, in an immediate sense, uh, the greatest need is for the parties to find a way forward, to find a way forward to hold free, fair, and credible elections. I guarantee only one thing. At some point, there will be a way forward found to do that. But, but I don't know when it will be. And I, I would say it should be, well, what is today, Friday? Well, tomorrow's a weekend. It should be Sunday. They should do it Sunday. Find a way forward on Sunday and announce it to everybody. It'll be a day of jubilation. And it'll be a day that uh, investors will feel comfortable, buyers will feel comfortable, and, and then the, the resources can come to start uh, creating the next Asian tiger. Because it won't happen by itself. It has to be made to happen. And Bangladesh has to make it happen. Thank you very much. And uh, sir, honestly, I really hate to do this. Uh, we are at the end of our conversation. Oh, no. It was uh, <laughs> such an exciting conversation. Uh, but uh, before we go, uh, uh, Asif Bhai, uh, any final thoughts? Uh, no, I think uh, it's, uh, I, I think I want to end with a sense of optimism. I think uh, uh, that we are, uh, I think, emerging uh, as a nation. Uh, and these are, of course, teething issues that comes in. And as long as we have this, um, the voices come in, and I think that's the power of democracy, that when you have this pluralism, uh, when you have all, all these different voices come in, if we can kind of, democracy is, I think it's messy. I think everybody agrees uh, that, but, but it's also sort of the best system. Uh, I think there's no, no argument about that. And, and it, it takes a while to get where we want to get to. So as long as the conversation channels, the communication channels are open and all of us are united into thinking that we want to get to that goal of becoming the Royal Bengal Tiger really, truly in the Asia, then I think sky's the limit. Uh, thank you very much, Asif Bhai. Uh, sir, uh, final question to you. Uh, how do you see uh, the U.S.-Bangladesh relationship growing?
grow in the coming year? Oh, I think we're going to go from strength to strength. This is what I told the foreign minister when I saw her just a couple days ago. Uh, we're going to hold another partnership dialogue. This time it'll be here in Dhaka, uh, maybe in June. We'll hold a security dialogue where we assess the various security aspects of our partnership. And we will continue our engagement on so many fronts, helping Bangladesh uh, in terms of food security, improved health, uh, adaptation to the challenges of climate change, maritime security, uh, preparing for natural disasters, cyclones, uh, building up this year and next, I think it's 130 more cyclone shelters we're building, all, all these things. And you know, sometimes people look at the newspaper and say, oh, there's this problem, oh, everything's going bad with American relations. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. You know, newspapers get paid to look at one or two challenging things. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> but the reality is, and this is the truth, the absolute truth, the partnership, the relationship between America and Bangladesh has never been better than it is this very moment as I sit in this chair in my own house. And I'm telling you this, tomorrow it'll be better. So thank you very much. It's always a pleasure uh, talking to you. And thank you once again for hosting the show in your home. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists. Thank you, Asif Bhai. Doshok, Achkir Moto Ar Dekhani Shesh Kochi, Parer Maashe Abaru Dekha Hove Notun Ko Noti Thi Shathe. Shabai Bhalo Thakun, Ar Deshe Shathe Thakun. Thank you.